My name is Andrea Wunderlich. I do market intel and strategy here at SAS Optics, becoming Maxio. Hi, my name is Todd Gardner. I uh, was the founder 15 years ago of a company called SAS Capital, and we funded, gosh, close to 70 SAS companies across the US and Canada and the UK. Before that, I was in venture, and before that, I was a tech consultant for Deloitte. Um, and so now I work with a bunch of SaaS companies, frankly, some of them on capital raises and um, some of them on other sort of thought leadership content. I'm John Cochran. I'm our VP of strategy here at Maxio. Uh, in a prior life, uh, I was a, I started my career in public accounting. So kind of came up through the ranks there before leaving to join a, a software SaaS business. Uh, served in a variety of roles, assistant controller, build our five-year model forecast, uh, ultimately corporate controller before coming over to lead the product team at SaaS Optics. And now that we're Maxio, really thinking about uh, how we can build the next, uh, you know, three to five years out, the next generation of products to, to help our customers. Sweet. Yeah, we got a good crew here. So um, I did have some specific questions for you guys uh, about the current market environment. So um you know, Todd, I'm, I'm sure you've seen all the noise in, in the market about the possibility of a recession. Um, I've contributed to some of the noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure some people watching this um, probably follow you and have seen you uh, talk about this. But uh, specifically, you know, you made a comment the other day uh, about how, you know, this this may be a little bit overblown. And, you know, right now it's kind of isolated to capital markets. And I was just curious if you could expand on that. Has your is your opinion changed in the last few weeks? And what what are you thinking? Yeah, I want to be uh, careful on this because I'm not really a public equities person. You know, I don't I don't trade public stocks, uh, SaaS stocks, on a regular basis. Um, but I did go through um, the 2000 recession collapse. I went through 08, in, all in the SaaS space. So. I have a couple of referential data points just from a historical perspective. And I'm just trying to be careful about what we know and what we don't know. Um, and certainly what we know is there's been a huge repricing of, of public um, stocks in general, but SaaS very specifically. Um, although I would remind folks, it's still well short of the correction that we had in 08. Um, both in SaaS companies and in the broader public markets. So stocks aren't down near as much as they were in 08. Um, and 2000 was very different because we just had some um, bad business models and companies that never should have been public or probably never should have been companies at all <laughs> who were public companies. Um, so I'm trying to like distill what we know now versus those two playbooks. And what we certainly haven't seen a lot of real data on is this is clearly going to be a recession and there's going to be substantially reduced demand for software products. Mm. And so given that it could, it could absolutely happen. Um, but we, we've seen some anecdotal stuff, um, but we haven't, the companies that I've talked to, they're including you guys, right? Their pipelines continue to be strong they're closing business. And the, I think the point I've been trying to make is the cost for teams to overreact in this environment is very high mm. given the, the employment situation, right? So it's like, oh, you know, let's conserve cash and lay off 20% of our employees because it really looks like Sequoia and Kraft think everything's going downhill. And then if it doesn't, which like, remember it didn't do at the beginning of the pandemic when these, you know, these things were also circulating, mm -hmm. right? Conserve cash, oh my God, fire your, you know, force. So anyway, I think I, I have a great deal of empathy for founders right now about having to make tough decisions, but we know capital is a lot more expensive what we don't know across the board is, is that the demand for SaaS products is going down mm. like it did in 08. And it absolutely did in 08. You, you couldn't sell new software. Um, but as we know today, you still can. Mm. Um, so anyway, that was my major point is focus on what we know to be true and don't overreact to speculation about you know, where demand might go. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I think it's, it's probably really hard to do, to kind of make your decisions in isolation. I mean, I know we've even internally at Maxio, we had them all hands last week where, you know, the CEO had a chat with everyone because, you know, elephant in the room, everything that's going on. And, you know, they, we just kind of reiterated our stance on, you know, pipeline strong demand is still there. Like we have, we have the runway, so we're going to go out and, and use this as an opportunity to be aggressive and, and capture more market share. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's definitely an important thing to keep in mind. John, I, I know uh, you and I have both poured over the Sequoia Capital and the Craft Ventures content recently and uh, gone back and forth on it. I'm curious just what, what you think about all this. Yeah, I think it's it's hard after reading and for, for anybody who hasn't read those, you know, Sequoia and Craft basically pulled together some, you know, they did some presentations with their portfolio companies and ran through some graphs, you know, Todd, about kind of the companies that survived and thrived on the other end of, you know, the, the collapse in the 2000, at the beginning of, you know, 2000, then in 08. And, and what are the, some of the things that they did and what are some things that we're seeing now and how do we have to respond? And some of the, uh, the punchlines there were you have to, you know, if you're a company that's been burning above a certain rate, you need to cut and cut aggressively and cut now. Uh, and it's hard not to look at some of those slides and go, oh my goodness, you know, they really are spelling some doom and gloom in here and companies need to take this seriously, especially, um, you know, if you've been hiring really ahead of what your current growth rates are. So um, I think my gut reaction after reading those was you better have a, a handle on what is your, your cash burn at this point and how much have you been spending to fuel your growth and is it scalable, sustainable, um, you know, the last thing you want to do is be caught with a surprise on that. And, uh, this is some of the presentations they went to as well, where, you know, they're, if you don't have a good handle on that, sometimes you, you know, you think you might be in an okay state all of a sudden to realize six months later that now you have to be reactive and make, make those deep cuts, you know, six months down the road. And I think Sequoia in predict, particular had a graph that showed how big that cost was to making that decision in six, nine months, as opposed to making the decision now, if you're, again, if your rates are above a certain threshold. So definitely doom and gloom. Um, but if you're a company who has been kind of practicing scalable growth, you had a little bit more measured um, mechanisms in place. So, so your cash is in a relatively uh, solid state, you know, it's not the same scenario for your business, which is certainly where everybody wants to be right now. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the, 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 the key takeaway that I've seen is just, you know, disciplined growth. I think that's something that, that everyone keeps coming back to. It seems like that kind of hockey stick trajectory is, as as attractive as it is, is, um, maybe not always the way that every company needs to go. And, um, I think a big thing, like you said, is hiring to match your, your current growth. Um, I realize it's not an option for, you know, a, a ton of companies, especially if they're venture backed and they have those really high expectations, but um, it does seem like there's a broader trend in the market towards that more disciplined growth approach and uh, as opposed to growth at all costs. And I actually had a, a, oh, go ahead, Todd. I was just going to just following up on that. The, um, so in the public markets, you're seeing exactly that. So um, I do a fair amount of correlating, you know, public stock multiples to various operating metrics. And growth is always the most important factor in terms of the valuation of a public SaaS company. And that's still the case today. It's just a lower correlation than it's ever been. And previously, profit margin, bottom line profit margin didn't matter at all. Mm. And now it's about a 40% weighting compared to the growth rate. So private SaaS companies, especially early stage, can't always, shouldn't react to what's going on in the public markets because it changes so fast. And it's like, that's five to 10 years away for you anyway. Mm. Um, but it is what the VCs are looking at. And so just to reiterate the point, um, profit has just become more important empirically in the, in the public markets. And that's showing up in the stock valuation. Todd, doesn't it feel like there's a pendulum 
where, you know, when, when times are good, everybody, you can feel like you're missing out if you're not fueling that hockey stick growth and, and going up to the right. And all of a sudden when times are bad, all of a sudden it shifts to the bottom line. I'm curious from, you know, like you said at the beginning of this, you funded a lot of different companies. It's almost like there's a peer pressure to, to keep up with whatever is relevant at the time, whether that be cuts or, or fueling growth. But I mean, I'm curious from your perspective, what are the, what are some things that are timeless that companies need to be doing regardless of the good times or bad that, you know, from your lens in particular, when you think, well, I get that's the, cap- the question. Yeah, well, this is a good lead into the, the spreadsheet, but so capital efficient growth is always better for the founder, you know, no matter what. And you, you can look at things and the spreadsheet helps, helps you do some of that. Like, what if I just throw a lot of money at it and I'm going to own less of it? And that, um, to me, that's a playbook right? That's mostly the Silicon Valley playbook. And that really gets whipsawed in times like this, right? Mm -hmm. I would also say there are thousands of SaaS companies who are more like your firm, who did raise some venture capital, but didn't raise hundreds of millions of venture capital. Their burn rate was never three or four times the revenue. You know, it might've been one times the revenue or a half times the revenue. Um, and so it takes longer to get to an exit, um, but uh, there's more value to share um, with the founders and the employees and it doesn't all go to the VCs. Um, so I feel like it's a particular playbook that's really hurt right now. Mm. And if you're backed by VCs and you, you've always been relatively capital efficient, this really isn't going to impact you that much Mm. Um, because those firms can actually support your growth rate. And the the thing I encourage everybody to do, and they probably already have, but if, if you're backed by institutional money or even if you're backed by any sort of angels or anything, talk to your investors, right? Here's where we are. Here's our 24 month plan. Here's our capital need. What are you guys thinking? Right. The way we see it is we're creating a lot of value in this period that's going to get rewarded, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, if they don't see it that way and they're not willing to fund it, then you do have to react. Mm. Right. So I'm, I'm very careful to say, look, I don't think this recession is real yet, but the constriction of capital is real for sure. And just communicating with those investors is like the most important thing you can do right now, because you might have to rely on your existing investors 100% for the next two or three years. And I, I think that's real. Yeah. But I think if they hear a good game plan, like, yeah, this is great. Let's go do this. Let's make hay, you know, while others are really struggling and we can hire some great talent. You know? Yeah. Yeah. All good points. I think you're right. This is a good segue into the, into the calculator. So um, Todd or John, either one, if you guys want to share your screen and, and, uh, play around. John, with why don't you, if you don't mind, can you drive and I'll just, yeah, you know, color. yeah. absolutely. Color I'll pull color. that up. Todd, right it'd be here. awesome if you could just give us like a quick overview of, um, what yeah, this, so this is was for. an attempt, um, with, with capital becoming more expensive and the game plan isn't just raise money at a high valuation and go spend it as fast as you can. Um, There's a point at which if your business is burning too much, and this goes back to the comments, John, that you made earlier, that Sequoia made and others, um, you could be destroying value, right? So the cost of capital was really high, your CAC isn't very good and you've got a high burn. Oh my gosh, when I add all that stuff up together, um, it's not worth it to raise money. Um, and maybe the founders will, will suffer or maybe everybody will suffer. And so this is an attempt to put in one spot um, everything you would need to know about the capital it's going to take to grow your business and the cost of that capital and really the impact on the founder. So this is a very founder-specific um, spreadsheet and it's meant to be one tool amongst you know many that obviously you're using to make these kinds of decisions yeah i think the the thing that i like about this calculator todd is you know in, in my past life when times got tight 
even if we weren't preparing this already, all of a sudden, cash burn spreadsheets became top of mind right away. So if we didn't have one, we created one. I've done that at a couple of companies now. But this one is nice in that, you know, many times you need to get a quick, uh, you know, a quick pulse point on what is my, you know, what is my total capital need over the, you know, the next 12, 24 months um, based on where my, you know, where my ARR is today, where I expect my ARR to be, you know, um, down the road, uh, based on some growth rates, it really kind of boils it down and gives you a, a nice summary here uh, very quickly. Uh, so I think it's a very, very useful tool. Um, do you think it, uh, Todd, maybe, maybe it would make sense just to talk through each three, you know, each of these sections, what they mean. We won't go through each, you know, one of these assumptions within here, but just, you know, as people are trying to use this, um, this calculator, you know, what should they be thinking about at each section? So why don't, why don't we begin with the top and uh, just, you know, what, what people would need to use for the purpose of the calculator. Okay. Are you sharing your screen? Okay. You've got it. All right. There it is. Yeah. So do you want me to talk through it? So this is just the highlighted, you know, the orange cells with the, with the blue are the, where you input values. So it really starts out just basic, like where you are in terms of ARR, your average um, contract value, your gross margin, which is really important um, component of this. You're obviously less capital efficient with a lower gross margin. And then your CAC ratio, and here the CAC ratio is the dollars of sales and marketing spending that it takes to create $1 of new ACV. Um, yeah, and then and an easy way to summarize that, because you know when I first got into SAS, some of these terms uh, were all new to me. And, and the quick way to calculate your CAC, especially if you're an early stage founder where you're trying to figure that out for the first time is just take a look at your sales and marketing expense in the prior month or prior quarter and compare that to your new business in the next quarter. You know, you take your new business divided by that and that's your CAC ratio. And that yep. would go right here. And it depends on the lead, your, you know, your average lead time, but uh, last quarter's sales and marketing to this quarter's new contract value is probably the most standard. And, and the nice thing, you know, Todd, I, when you put, when you pulled together this calculator is actually, you know, we give you a bunch of other metrics that are relevant and, you know, your investors certainly would care about. So, you know, as you uh, populate some of these values, uh, some of the the cells in white will actually update and will flow through to the different assumptions. So you know if you have a seventy five percent gross margin rate, right, that changes everything. So just uh, the nice thing is you'll learn a little bit more about your business as you go too. So and, and John put in these sample values to like make you feel good about your company because that's <laughs> a really bad CAC ratio. And not yes, a great that is margin. <laughs> that is a bad CAC yeah. ratio. We could make this look much better. It's like we're doing so much better than these guys. Um, yes. And so the way this whole model is set up is it's a 24 month lookout. And, and I would say, given the current environment, that's a pretty standard like, hey, I've got, I'm thinking about raising capital. I want to, I want to do X with this capital in 24 months. So in this setup here, this is a, a $10 million ARR business that wants to grow by $10 million in ARR over the next two years. So that's really the goal. And then what the calculator does is figure out, okay, how much money is it gonna to take to do that? And then what's the cost of capital and what happens to the founder's position based on that? So um, it's just set up for 24 months. So in this case, we're trying to double the business in 24 months. We also yeah. add things in like, uh, and this is a very important concept right now. Look, CAC, CAC is your incremental spend on getting a new customer. But oh, by the way, you have to pay for people like John and Andrea, and you're probably running a burn too. And like that takes real money. That's not hypothetical. It's not unit economics, but it's real economics. And so you have to fund that burn as well. And then we figure out, look, you're not going to keep all your customers. So, you know, over this 24 months, there's going to be leakage in revenue. Um, and then we plug in the valuation multiples. So that also goes into the calculation. Yeah. And, and Tom, one thing. Oh, it's like, hey, what did you own before? Um, and at what value? 
so John and I debated this. There's two values here. There's one that you might ultimately exit at, and there's one, um, the valuation that you're raising money at. And best practice is to keep those two things the same because you really don't know what's gonna happen in the future, um, but you can play around with that and see its impact. Um, and then ultimately, there's a section, John, I think it's up and to the right, which is just the outputs. Um, and this is like, look, to do this, to grow your business, to double it in two years, it's going to take $50 million in capital. That's what you need to go to raise. And after you sort of work your way through the dilution and other things and think about an exit, you know, in this example, which is a pretty bad CAC ratio and a pretty low gross margin, um, you destroy value, right? So your $50 million invested generates less than a $50 million increase in enterprise value. Um, and that's how that pain is distributed amongst the founders, the VCs and the other owners. Um, so right. that's the super high level. Yeah, and it's, it's nice to see, you know, for example, Todd, if we say we had a more reasonable CAC ratio, if it didn't cost us as much, those, you know, those values shift very quickly. So this concept of efficient growth, if, you know, we have an efficient way of getting new customers, it's pretty wild to see how that I ratio mean, in particular is very important. One of the powers of the model is like to understand where the sensitivities are. So CAC, yep. super high sensitivity retention, surprisingly. Uh, not surprisingly to me, but it's more sensitive than you think. Um, and then the obviously the valuations that you raise the money at or sell at. Something right. that was striking to me, and I don't know why I didn't figure out this before, is a founder is always a seller. So higher valuation multiples are good in all situations. They're good for the founder when they're raising the money and they're good for the founder when they're exiting. And I'm, maybe that was surprising to me because I was a VC for so long and I was trying to get in a low multiple and exit at a high one, but it's like, no. So across the board, um, obviously some of the sensitivity is around valuation multiples, but the operating metrics drive these numbers much more aggressively than the valuation multiples, which might be yeah. one of the takeaways here, even though the markets are down. Yeah, one thing I, I we did make to change of this, Todd, I know uh, we actually made the target timeline here dynamic. So, you know, if you say had a, a three-year runway, you can actually update this and see how that would impact some of these outputs here, and it'll dynamically update the uh, the waterfall here. Great. So, um, but yeah, That's like Todd, cool. yeah, yeah, like Todd was saying, you know, the the annual retention, very, you know, sensitive. You can see how just by um, dropping 5% uh, in your annual retention, we actually took off about a $10 million profit at the end of the day. So, you know, hopefully this is helpful to everybody uh, who downloads this tool. Um, I know this would be something that uh, our finance team would be using historically to really understand this, especially if we had some of that hockey stick growth that we were talking about earlier where our burn rate was relatively high and we knew there was a funding event needed on the horizon. Um, I would, I'll make one last comment and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, uh, so since a lot of folks are doing more detailed 24 or 36 month forecast, like I think this can be used as a complementary tool where they can kind of actually yes. maybe even take those forecast numbers, plug them in here, and then at that, essentially at that point, you're layering on sort of the capital markets view of the world and seeing um, you know, value creation or, or destruction. So I think it can be used as a complement to maybe a more detailed plan that folks are using for runway. Yeah, and there are lots of different ways. Like you know, Todd, we were talking previously, um, depending on certain business practices, it changes to business practices that you have in place, they, they can have pretty dramatic impacts on the model. We set this model up assuming that you're billing your customers monthly, but if you were to shift that to annual billing, uh, that has a pretty dramatic impact on you know what your cash flow looks like since you're getting paid up front for the next 12 months. Yep, precisely. Yeah, I think this is great, guys. I think this is going to be super valuable for so many people. And <clears throat> um, like you said, great for companies that are billing monthly, but 
Um, if you're if you're considering switching to annual and you'd like to see a new calculator that shows that, um, let us know and we'll, we'll put one together. Um, but yeah, this was awesome. Thank you guys so much for your time. Um, I think people are really gonna find this valuable. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Thanks. See you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, y'all.